right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Jack Miller and Dean Cottrell with T360 here for our annual uh, trends report, uh, fast paced overview to give you guys all the new information about the recently released uh, Swanepoel trends report for 2022. I actually just got my copies as well. Uh, so some of you may have received your copies if you pre-ordered. Uh, if you have not ordered, we will have a special offer for you uh, that with, with those of you that show up and are fans of T360. So uh, so hang on to that. Uh, Dean, we've got a lot of content to cover this yeah. morning. Yeah, we're excited. Um, and I love uh, something on to everyone. You know, this is this overview. And on the inside cover of the trends report, it's actually very pertinent what it says. It says, we don't create the news. We don't report the news. We analyze the news and understand why it's happening and then provide it, the impact it's going to have on the industry. So all good. Great. So uh, I think um, Chris Riley is manning our uh, on everybody coming on board. I know we've got we had four or five hundred people register for this thing and uh, we have a, we have a ton to cover. So I think uh, why don't we why don't we hop in? I'll give a quick intro for those of you just joining. My name is Jack Miller. I'm the president of T360. I've been with the firm for uh, eight years now. Uh, we have done uh, this Swanepoel Trends Report now for 17 years, and this was uh, our founder, Stefan Swanepoel, created this report as a way of analyzing, digesting, understanding the industry and where it's going and where it's headed. Uh, it is a ridiculously high quality report for uh, what it is for this industry, and I think that is, that is one of the things when I, I got my copy and went through it, and again, high quality really great graphics, uh, great takeaways, a lot of actionable content in here. And we're going to try to cover all of it in an, in an hour. So we're going to move very fast. Dean, I'm going to start my little, I got my little timer running over yeah, here. Is, <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to get going. I'm going to pull up, pull up the screen. Dean, introduce yourself while I'm doing that. And then sure. uh, we'll, we'll get going. So my name's Dean Cottrell. I'm at 32 years in industry um, as a sales agent for eight. And then I was in leadership roles for the rest of that timeline. And I've been in my position here, uh, senior vice president. I oversee the brokerage consulting division uh, for the last close to four years now. It's perfect. All right. Well, um, be prepared to take a lot of notes. Uh, this is being recorded, so you'll get a copy of the recording if you want to rewatch. Uh, it's not possible to cover the entire contents of this report in an hour. So Dean and I have pre-reviewed it. We've gotten some of our takeaways and highlights. We pulled out some graphs and charts that we wanted to talk about, and we're just going to move very quickly through the whole thing. Uh, if you do have questions or comments, feel free to drop them in. In the, in the event we end up with any time to address them, we will look at them uh, and, and attempt to address them. But my guess is we're going to be running hard for the next hour. So let's go, Dean. So um, first of all, these are the there are nine trends this year. And let me talk a little bit about how we get to the trends. Uh, each year, our entire company, we have about 25 full-time people. About half of those are actively in consulting, working with brokers, franchisors, MLSs, associations, service providers. And we brainstorm what is happening in the industry and usually come up with 20 or 25 different uh, things that we think are, are changing, shifting, uh, taking place in the industry. And then we spend some time really scrutinizing those. And our whole team goes through and says, well, is this really a trend? Is this something that's happening yet? Or is it it's kind of a fad or it's something that might happen? It's not quite there yet. And we get, try to get it down to usually nine or 10 key trends. The trends in this trends report are intended to be on the executive agenda. These are things that we believe are important enough, big enough, impactful enough that as an executive in the industry, you will need to know them and may need to incorporate them into your business plan and into your strategy. Dean, any comments on the, the evaluation of trends and what it is? Uh, it's actually exactly what Jack just said. So the this ready, let's jump right into the first one because cool. it's great. Gonna... All right, so uh, Dean, lead us through this one. So this is trend nine is the impact of new construction and uh, yeah. how, that, how that comes into housing. So give us a little, little uh, kickoff here. Yeah, so for part of this is looking at the demand for homes, the demand for housing right now, as we know, there's low inventories. So looking at the trend of new construction and how it plays into the mix. And this chapter dives deep into a bunch of graphs and, and insight into the home, uh, home building industry going taking historical information and data and providing it to us, looking at the current challenges, and then gives you the kind of the map of what it looks like looking into the future and in the short range future of how that's gonna play into the homes that are gonna be available in the new home space and how, how that's gonna affect the total homes available. Um, so we can dive into the chat, let's yeah, go dive let's, into the next chart. 
So we pulled some charts out of the chapter that I think tell the story really well. So this was um, new single family home sales for the US for the last 20 years. So you can see these are, these are new homes and trend in new home purchasing. So we're still on a recovery cycle from that peak that we were having in 2007, 2008. Dean, any comments on this? Yeah, one of the things that comes out in the chapter uh, is the fact as you can see we got a little above where we were pre uh, great recession way back even to 2000 in the growth there and it's dropped off a little bit the challenge is is that the population growth from 2008 to 2020 has been 25.6 million and the housing growth has only been 11 million so that's one of the things that's added to the challenges in the amount of inventory of homes on the market yeah so let's look at this this is existing home sales uh, in the, the existing trends in, uh, in, in you know, currently built properties, just for reference. So this is, we're, we're on an uptrend currently and continue to be moving in that general direction of mm -hmm. existing home sales um, happening. Uh, in, any that's comments pretty, there, Dean, on that? Yeah, that's pretty consistent. You know, five and a half million, six million. And some things to realize is these are homes sold. So if you think about sides, as we do in the brokerage industry, you got to multiply that by two. So five and a half is going to be roughly 11 million sides. So yeah. think of it that way. And we have, we talk about paces and we're on pace right now. We're on pace for a 6 million uh, total units being sold this year at the current pace. Yep. That's great. And then I think this is where we start to tell a little bit of the story of where we are, which is the, uh, the housing units started. And again, see the, the huge impact of the recessionary period that we went through. So Dean, talk us through this chart. Yeah, amazing uh, how it's dropped off. I had mentioned a little bit this briefly earlier, but new homes have dropped off because of the challenges that we had. They, we call it the Great Recession uh, in that in the 2007, 8, 9 period of time. The low point was for housing, new construction in the marketplace. So I think it was 142,000. Yeah, here I got it here. Low, all-time low for homes on the market, new homes, new properties being built was 142,000 back in July of 2000, 2012. Um, we steadily increased from that time and moved on up. The challenge is though, the builders are still having challenges with all kinds of other things, in, you know, the idea of construction workers. Um, we have workforce right now, talking about workforce challenges. There's 339,000 construction jobs that are unfilled currently. We also have the challenges on the cost of things. I was talking yeah. to someone who's in the new home space here just today, and they were talking about how they've had to do price increases because of lumber charges and delays and other things. And those are caused some challenges on fallouts, all kinds of other things for builders as they move forward. Yeah, it's, it, it's all just led to a, a gap, which I think we have on the, this next chart. This, this for me is like the sum up of what's, what's really happening. So Dean, talk to us a little bit about the deficit here. Yeah, the deficit is what I mentioned earlier. There's a deficit. If you look at 2000 and then the peak 2005 single family housing deficit, and then you've had a major drop off on the new homes and the construction, but population growth has continued. We also have the millennials. There's 72 million millennials ages 25 to 40 that are entering into and with low interest rates. That demographic, that lar it's the largest demographic cohort, as you describe it, it's moving into the housing market. And we have a major differential between housing that's available and the amount of people moving into the marketplace. It's a huge deficit. Yeah, and I, I think that seeing where it is and where it needs to be, you know, the, that, that's a huge gap. So is the level needed to close to the housing deficit? <laughs> Uh, we'd have to build houses at that level for a decade to get caught up, which is remarkable. You know, that, that's just a huge piece. And then um, another piece in the chapter that I that stood out for me was the cost of regulation and uh, compliance and kind of all the things that make it a challenge, which ends up being this huge. So talk to us a little bit about that costing, because this is this was surprising to me. Yeah, it was surprising to me as well. The thing at 93, almost ninety four thousand dollars. This is regulations zoning laws, other things that are challenging that builders have to go through in acquiring and building a home. And it ended up equating to roughly 24% of the price of a property is coming into this, is, this area right here. And the average price right now we're looking at is 394,000. The medium price, meaning if you took 100 units and that was the total new home sold, where would that 50th home be in the medium area? It's 304, 304,000. So, but the average is 394. And seeing this was, wow, 94,000 to invest time, money, and energy in 94 layout with the expectation someone's going to line up 
Also, the other thing in the art in the chapter, which I found was fascinating, was the timeline. It is a timeline of 18 to 18 months to three yeah. years to go from the ability of developing land and building and then get it uh, to the market. So that was another challenge that uh, falls in this space. Yeah, it's not a it's not a short process. It's, it's, it's a commitment of both capital and some time. And then uh, the other piece, and this feeds in, this kind of wrappers into some of our other chapters talking about where, where are housing starts happening? And, you know, this chapter does a nice job of bringing, so talk just a little bit about the, the differences of where new housing is showing up. Yeah, we're going to, the great reshuffling, we're going to talk about that in an upcoming ch chapter, dive into it really deep. This was very interesting to see the different regions of the country and where more new homes are being built, where's the desire more and seeing the South region continues to be. And if you even go back to 2000, these trend lines are still the same on who's number one, two, three, and four. Um, there's disparity between the differences, but the South region by far has continued to grow and the Northeast region continues to be, you can see it's flatlined. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's actually gone down from the 2004, five range, 2006 range. Yeah, the, the, the low tax, warm climate states that have, have growing economies are where all those housing starts are happening. So that's, that is it for trend nine. Let's do real quickly our takeaways. So reading through the chapter, these were takeaways. Dean and I talked about these before the call. Um, it looks the demand for homes is remains strong. We don't see it. There's no, no apparent sign that that is going to slow down. Uh, there's a deficit. This is a, this is a market problem. This is a we don't have enough supply. And there's way more demand, which is going to continue to maintain high prices for housing. And that doesn't appear to be changing. There's some other charts in the chapter showing where the housing starts are. More high, higher priced housing is being built there as well, which kind of supports this thesis. It's not enough affordable housing being built. And I think uh, another takeaway that Dean and I got from this chapter is we really need to get behind things to make it easier to build housing. There's just too much. Yeah. There's yeah. too much regulation. Uh, we need to support policies and initiatives to get more homes on the ground because there's just not enough of them. And those homes become the resale homes that this industry works with every single day. And, and a lot of our, our you know, top performers also work with new construction and do a lot of new construction sales. So, so, uh, so that's it for trend nine. Let's move on to trend eight. Okay, so this one's a fun one. Um, when we discuss this, uh, this potential inclusion in the trends report, uh, Stefan and myself and, and Dean and the rest of the team, uh, Kelly and Michelle and everybody, we said, you know what, no one's ever really looked at media in real estate. And some interesting things have happened with media in real estate this last year. We've had two companies that have both uh, effectively changed hands and been purchased by uh, private equity. And so, and those were, that's uh, Steve Murray's Real Trends and the media assets associated with that. And uh, Inman's, Inman News has also been purchased by private equity uh, purchasers. So it's kind of an interesting time to see large media companies get purchased. So we decided to go, let's do an analysis of news in real estate and try to see if we can understand something about how it works. Uh, so here's what we did. We looked at the kinds of content that these media outlets published and said, what are the major content categories that they cover? And then what are the sources? Where, who, who's actually going and getting the data? Are, are they, is it contributed to them? Somebody sent them an article. They have a staff writer who's writing it. Is it sponsored? You know, was it submitted like a press release? Just to understand where it comes from. We looked at the top media sources and then named a lot of the other contributing sources. But just for this presentation, we just included the top uh, six in here. So, uh, so this is Inman News. Uh, we looked at Inman and broke down. These are this is where they're where they're focused on their content. So, the top three categories here: news briefs, a lot of how to, practical how to, step by step, and then sponsored content being their top categories. About um, two thirds of their content is coming from a staff writers. They actually have a, a fair number of internally sourced articles where they're out there researching and writing, and creating that. <laughs> about 10%, almost 12% of our content is coming through sponsors. So that's Inman News. Housing Wire, we went and looked at Housing Wire. The, Housing Wire is the organization that bought, um, it, it, you know, that, that has come in to the industry and is acquiring uh, and bought, ended up buying uh, Steve Murray's uh, operation and content. Uh, the news briefs made up a, a little over half of the percentage there. Uh, analysis about 20%. And again, sponsor content about 14, almost 15% uh, of that. I get fairly good a mix of staff writers and contributors. They've got a number of staff writers who are writing for them. So, 
So this is Real Trends. So Real Trends content uh, evaluated separately from Housing Wire, um, although now Housing Wire owns the media content. Uh, about two thirds of it news briefs. Uh, a chunk more analysis, a little more analysis content out of this, and really notably not any sponsored content coming through the Real Trends channel as, as it was when we analyzed it over the week period that we did the analysis. So uh, so pr pretty, uh, pretty clean as far as not having uh, a lot of advertiser content uh, and a little bit more analysis focused. So Riz Media, looking at this channel, uh, Riz Media maintains both a print publication and a website uh, that they do. It's heavy on press releases, sponsored content, and news. Um, you'll see almost almost uh, uh, half of the content is coming through either press release or sponsored content. Uh, and a significant, this is where you see a significant change. This uh, There's a lot more submitted content in the week that we analyzed uh, and uh, a, a, number, a number of articles versus the ones that are generated internally by staff writer. So that's Riz Media. Uh, we also looked at Realtor Magazine. Realtor Magazine, very straightforward, primarily news briefs and press releases. Um, most of it being news briefs, uh, most of it sourced internally, right? And then the last one we looked at was The Real Deal, which is New York Real Estate News. Uh, this one, heavy on news briefs. It's a smaller publication, not as many articles, uh, in, so not as, not as much to evaluate, but, uh, but an interesting regionally focused outlet that looks to be expanding into other markets outside of New York. So... Uh, and then we did a comparison in the chapter, and we included a lot of other uh, other industry outlets and important media segments to look at, uh, and then provide some comparisons between them. So, Dean, talk to us a little bit. How do you think about the news after reading through that chapter, and and how I, you I love this chapter. Media? Yeah, I love this chapter. It actually gave you some really good insight into these organizations. You know, you're I'm familiar with all of them, of course. But I really didn't know the nuts and bolts of them. I didn't know the percentages of you know who was writing. It was interesting also to see the number of articles. Like mm -hmm. Inman had written that one week was forty four articles. Others are twelve, eleven. Yeah. Just just the size and the scope uh, of what they're bringing to the table. And you know, was it sponsored? Because that's one of the things. Is it sponsored? Is someone pitching something from their perspective to sell something, or is it coming from more of an independent mind thinking and providing providing some type of uh, insight into something in our business? Yeah, I, I think it, understanding how these entities operate and what they what their purposes are and how they generate content kind of lets you take the filter and and uh, understand it better and say, okay, I understand why things are showing up the way they're showing up and who's writing about what. So these were some of our takeaways. Um, the media space, interestingly, also consolidating uh, with potentially some new players with new agendas who are uh, either you know acquiring in or building new new media brands. Uh, I think for us taking this evaluative approach helps understand the news better. Let's 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 understand where is this news coming from, uh, what is the purpose of it, uh, and you know I think both Dana and I felt that that balance of news and analysis versus sponsored content press releases was important because you know if you're reading a press release. You're, you're getting, it's coming from the person that, that wants to release about that. You know, they have a promotional aspect in mind as opposed to an analytical one. So important. So uh, great on trend eight. I'm going to keep us moving right along. We are, I yep. show we are at, uh, we're at 16 minutes in. So we're, we're going to keep, keep moving. So this is a great chapter. This is probably, Dean, the, uh, one of the most nuts and bolts useful chapters. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about branch, the branch manager magic and how to find it. Yeah, this is a powerful chapter. They're all powerful, but this specifically in the brokerage world, um, really we dive into how to hire and how to retain um, a, a top talent as a complete uh, overview. This is leadership. We're talking about leaders in the industry, leaders in the branch manager chair, specifically in this chapter. For those of you, and it could be a leader of a one office company, it could be a leader in multiple office company, whatever it is, what's the process? How do you find great talent? And then how do you also then, um, how do you help that great talent become better or talent become great talent and move yeah. into those chapters? So we dive into this. Kelly did a phenomenal job, Kelly White, our T3 talent and putting this together. So here's an overview. We did create some of the position really clear. And one of the things I did when I oversaw a lot of managers and let and work with a lot of managers, you've got to have really clear job summary that you can see there. What is that job? Make sure clarity is extremely important. You see the compensation. Compensation, we gave it a range, 100 to 150, but it all depends, frankly, on location, where you are geographically. If your average sales price is 180,000, which I don't know where anywhere, I'm sure there are places in the United States, 180,000, but 200 lower point price points, let me say it that way. You're probably not going to be paying 100,000 
base salary for right. uh, for a manager. But that said, it's just basically looking at the overlay of the real estate market. One hundred thousand, one hundred fifty. One of the beliefs that I I've always had is you got to pay somebody. It's a, it's the most one of the most important roles, if not the most important roles in an operate brokerage operation is that manager they touch everybody from the consumer to the agent and they connect and it's important to have a top talent person there key yeah. indicators the eyes you see bottom left you got to keep them that's that clarity piece one of the things i would always say to my guys is like hey listen this is going to come off as really cute and it's not meant to be cute it's meant to be clear if you recruit you stay and if you don't you won't that was kpi number one you need to recruit, you need to grow, you need to be focused on that. We dive into other things as well. The idea of profit, increasing profit per person productivity and other things. And you see the minimum requirements in the position. Yep. And then we, we also included, this is for those of you that are hiring, rehiring, retraining, all of that. We have a list of both the job description and some of the key areas that uh, they're responsible for that should go into your job training to make sure they understand what they need to be doing as a branch manager. So. Yep. Um, I think this is probably one of the more useful slides in this chapter. So talk to us a little bit about the, the this particular uh, approach, looking at what kind of branch manager you, are you looking for? Yeah, so as you're thinking about, so one of the things we have the startup, put them in different categories, startup growth and maturity, looking at where they are. And one of the things I kind of equate to this is depending on say a large organization, just for the idea of this conversation, a startup manager, a startup would be someone I'm gonna put into a lower, smaller market. Uh, a smaller office, get them in there. Let's see what they're able to do. Are they able to prove themselves, put systems in place, drive profit, recruit talent, retain the talent that's there, things like that. And you can see in there recruiting, retention, management, oversight, finance, accounting. How do they play in that startup role? And then if they grow and they find great talent, I always found great ability to move people up into a larger opportunity. This is someone into the growth phase where they're uh, looking to grow their grow an operation that's in a great market, a, a more maybe a higher populated market with both houses and people where they can actually then attract. I always consider people we're all magnets. You want to attract great talent. You want to retain great talent. And the maturity level is that mature level. That's that manager who is a leader who's been in the market, who's attracted and retained great talent, doing wonderful things. The article does go in depth in each one of these. We do give case studies on each one of these. We're going to show up personas in just a second on each one of these as well. On the maturity one, though, be careful because this is where everyone gets stagnated. Typically, they're in there, they're riding their start. Some people start to coast and they just say, you know what, uh, things are going well, the numbers are good, and they coast. And that's, you know, an operation, no matter what size, it's either getting bigger or smaller every day, it never stays the same. And so that's got a one thing you just got to be careful of on the maturity stage. Yeah. And then this, this is intended to help you think about what business stage are you in and what, yep. you know, where do you need, what kind of uh, branch manager you need to focus. So this is, uh, the chapters do include these personas. So this is a, a persona description of a, a person who is in a startup phase, uh, early stage or in, in their career as a branch manager, uh, a growth phase. And there's a, a really great description of what that person looks like and how they, how they act and, you know, how they move all of that. And then a mature a uh, business leader who can run a larger organization, uh, take on a larger, maybe 100, 200, 300 uh, agent branch and, and what they what you can expect from them and, and how they would work. So uh, biggest question we get is how to find them. And Kelly White, who runs our T3 Talent uh, business unit is in charge of that. She's helped a lot of our clients find branch managers. And then she included in here, these are, these are her top sources for finding quality uh, branch managers your network of personal professional allies, people that are in the industry that know you and know your business, uh, referrals from your own employees and agents, people that have worked with some, somebody before at another company, uh, executive recruiting companies. Uh, and we've, we've entered that space. We have an offer in that space to help companies find a, a talented branch manager or multiple branch managers. Uh, social media has ended up being a way to, uh, to identify people uh, with that. And, and actually we've run some, we've had some good success running advertising in social media and on job sites such as LinkedIn and Indeed to find people that are looking for that career opportunity to move up. Um, so those are our top sources, a little bit of our, our secret sauce. So there you have it. Let's move on to trend six. So this, this one I'll take, Dean. Uh, this okay. one is the, the technology consolidation wave. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of consolidation uh, in technology over the last 
two to three years. And this is driven by some of the other trends we're going to talk about in, the, in this report. Uh, we have, we've got a, a trend number two is on private equity. And in that, uh, uh, all of the private equity money that has come into the industry is driving this consolidation. And so you're seeing companies that are, you know, it seems like every week somebody is getting, is buying somebody else on the technology side. It's just very, very prevalent right now. So in this chapter, we talk about kind of what's driving that consolidation, that we, we, we do have this private equity money coming in. We do have a lot of, of companies that they have money to spend to buy. And then break it down to understand why are they buying companies? What is the purpose of those consolidations? And we talk about kind of the three core reasons that we're seeing that con these consolidations or acquisitions are happening. Product development, market penetration, and market expansion. I'm really quickly going to go through those. So product development, this is where companies are buying another company because they don't, they've, they've done a build versus buy evaluation and said, you know what? It's, it's maybe more effective for us to go buy a company that has a product that we were thinking about building. It's just better. We get it to market faster. Uh, maybe we get something that already has some nice competitive advantages in, in built into it, uh, already has some customers, and then we don't have to spend the two or three years. A lot of times that speed to market, if you have to build something from scratch, it can take a long time. So product development is a key reason the majority of the acquisitions are being done due to product development. And I listed two companies here, Elm Street Technology and Lone Wolf have both done, if you look at some of their acquisitions, you're saying, hey, you know, uh, Elm Street did not have a CRM platform until they bought Exact Contact, right? And then they had a very fully featured CRM platform. Uh, Lone Wolf was in a very similar situation when they bought LionDesk. So both of those are companies that have bought in order to do product development. Second is market penetration. Market penetration is um, I want to own more of the market. This is where a technology company says, I'm, I'm going to to take a segment of the market, I want to get a bigger piece of it, right? And one way to do that is you go buy somebody that already has a piece you want, right? So this is classic just acquisition of market. Both Lone Wolf and Constellation have done this. Lone Wolf owns multiple Forms products. Now, Dean, I know you've, you've used some of the Forms products before, and they've I, I know yeah. Instanet, yeah, Instanet Forms was in the Instant. footprint you were in. And, yep. uh, and, and so they own both Instanet and they own Zipform which is kind of remarkable. Those are both very large uh, forms products. Constellation is another similar one. The Constellation owns many things where they have several different, uh, they, they bought several different predictive marketing tools, uh, such as offers, right? So they, they would go buy one and say, you know what, this is a market we're going to consolidate it by buying up companies that are in it. So that's the second reason. Uh, and the third reason is market expansion. And this is where a company is just going to go into a whole new market segment. And the best example uh, this year, I think, is CoStar, where CoStar, commercially focused, not in residential at all, has then bought into, they bought homes.com, they bought HomeSnap, and now they're, they're looking to, to move into the residential market via this acquisition strategy. So they're expanding their market opportunity entirely. So that's the third reason. So um, they bought houses.com too. Uh, houses.com yeah we're, we got a whole chapter we're gonna do we're gonna go deep on costar so um so here these are some companies that this is happening also on the brokerage side as well these are some of the brokerage companies that have uh, made some purchases of technology in the space uh and that appears also to be a a, a a a trend where we're seeing more of that happening where brokers are saying hey we large especially large brokers just large franchise are saying hey we we want to own certain key technologies uh, maybe not everything but we want to own certain key technologies so we're seeing that happen and then we did looked over the last um uh three to four years and looked at key technology acquisitions that have what i think is probably the most comprehensive list of all the acquisitions that have happened with technology uh over the last um two to three years um takeaways from this chapter uh, there's a great set of uh, takeaways in the uh, back of the chapter that uh, you guys should go look at about how to handle contracts and what to do with those. That's important. We think this technology consolidation is going to continue. Uh, there's capital. There's companies that are acquirable. Uh, understanding why a company got, got acquired, if it was for product development versus market expansion. You know, A lot of times market expansion, one product is going to win out in that. If, they buy, if you buy two things that do exactly the same, probably one of those is going to get more resources than the other, potentially, not always, but potentially. Um, so we have a set, like I mentioned, there's a set of recommendations in the chapter about how to buy technology, how to think about it uh, with regard to knowing that it may, it may get acquired by somebody else. Dean, any comments on that uh, acquisition 
Yeah, uh, the I, last the last bullet that we have here, I think the chapter does a phenomenal job uh, for the broker owners that are in the audience of really thinking through the technology stack, the technology vendors that they have and making good, wise decisions in making sure uh, as you step forward into any space yeah, yeah. and look to a technology provider, I think it really does a good job to say, you know what, you should take a close look at parent company, take a, take a bigger look than just the tool itself. Yeah, there's two of them that I'll put out, paying attention to the contract and what, if, if there is a change of control, being able to, to, uh, to end the contract earlier if you need to, if your, your products get acquired by somebody that you consider competitive and having a pre-planned exit strategy. And to do that at the beginning, those are the top two tips from that list, but there's a bunch of others in that list about what to think about as far as, consolidation is not a, necessarily a bad thing, but it's something, it's a reality as brokerages uh, and franchisors and even, even uh, MLSs, we have to think a lot about this because this is not going to slow down or stop. All right, trend five, this is our deep dive on CoStar Group. Um, so Dean, tell us, talk to us a little bit about CoStar. What did you, what did you learn from the chapter? Um, tell us a little bit about it. I love, you know, we're going to show a couple of slides to everybody, but CoStar, here comes another player that was you know, outside, you know, in the commercial space, wasn't in the residential space and has been moving in strong. And this plays right into, as we lay out and we get into our trend one here, uh, it really kind of plays into the amount of money uh, flowing into this industry and organizations coming in and gobbling up others. Um, I thought it was a great overview of the transition. And I think the time graph that we're going to show too is really shows how pieces of the puzzle are coming together uh, for this organization. Perfect. Yeah. And this is an overview just of CoStar by the numbers. I mean, this is an impressive organization, uh, number one in the commercial real estate transaction flow, uh, huge amount of activity in commercial. Uh, and, and they're growing their projected revenue. I think 1.7 billion now projected to do 2 billion this year. Um, you know, this is a muscular organization <laughs> that, we're, that we're working with here, uh, very strong. Um, we looked at where they got their revenue last year. Uh, so went through all their public filings and statements and looked at where, where are they making money today? So uh, analytics, real estate information analytics, about 40%, their multifamily marketplace, about 36%. So that's really... You know, when they look at residential, they, they've done so well in the marketplace and analytics areas in commercial uh, that saying, hey, are there ways that we can apply our understanding of how to operate these marketplaces and how to look at real estate in order to, to grow? And that's, that's the assessment they appear to have made. Um, also have done a ton of acquisitions. So they're, they're very experienced in acquiring and quite willing and able to do it. So we went through and looked at how many of these acquisitions that they've done over the past um, you know, couple, couple of decades. And this is, a, this is a company that knows how to do it, is probably gonna do it more. Um, so this I think is the timeline you're talking about that we did look real in-depth. This is an in-depth timeline of, of, of CoStar and then going a little bit more high resolution into what's happening in the residential space. So any comments on this, Dean, about the, the, the pace of CoStar into our industry here? It, it, just speeding up, as you can see, as you were talking to the slide prior to this actually showed that too, as you go through it, see the acquisitions and how they're moving in more and more and acquiring pieces, as I said, to the puzzle as we're putting together. I think they're great visuals. It allows you to see, um, this is part of the trends, the whole idea of our trends report is getting more insightful information and will be more knowledgeable so you can make great ex executive decisions in the running of your business, wherever that is in the marketplace. And so getting to see how big operators like a CoStar is operating, frankly, you can bring that down to your level and see what they're doing and how that implements, how that might impact you, but also how could you take lessons from what they're doing to implement into your business? Yep, that's it. So these are some of our takeaways from looking at reading the chapter and discussing it. Um, it appears that CoStar is following some of the commercial real estate industry playbook, uh, acquiring companies, building out these product offerings. Um, CoStar does an extremely lucrative business in commercial uh, selling advertising and providing a marketplace uh, for commercial real estate and replicating that into the residential environment appears to be the play here. Um, the your listing your lead is a key message. If any of you were at NAR, that was plastered over just about everything in downtown San Diego, courtesy of CoStar. Uh, and it appears to be a differentiation strategy for them that they are they're focused on that um, on that strategy and looking looking at their uh, product offerings and other segments. It's it's easy to see how they're going to 
use that in order to uh, to make money in the residential real estate industry. Uh, they are, they're definitely going to be charging for paid promotion, placement, helping people get more traffic to their listings, things like that in one vehicle or another. Like that, that that's that's the playbook here. Uh, and we think this is the beginning for CoStar. Um, look for further acquisitions and moves. This is this does not appear to be a, a, a decision lightly taken. They're well resourced and uh, definitely look to do more in residential. There, there, there's more to come there. So Dean, any any closing closing thoughts on CoStar? No, I think you nailed it. Got it. Great. Trend four. So this is the fun one. This is reshuffling. This is another uh, uh, Paul Bishop chapter. Uh, Paul Bishop is our our uh, uh, doctor in yeah, no, doctor in economics, a PhD, uh, and has studied the real estate industry for years and years and years and years. Uh, so his chapters are just super fun because they're just full of stats and charts and facts and really great stuff here. So Dean, take us through a little yeah. bit of the, the great reshuffling. Let's talk about it. Yeah, part, the positioning of this chapter was really talking about the pandemic and the reshuffling of people and where they live. And it's really looking at the pandemic and what the sense is. And from the numbers, there's been an intensification um, to the, the basically mobility patterns that have been consistent. Um, but actually there's been an intensification. There's just a speeding up. And two main reasons Paul draws in this is the fact is that there are two main reasons and significant changes have taken place. And that's because of how people live and how people work now uh, right. because of the pandemic. Uh, we also had home nesting uh, and there's some charts here, but we got in home nesting where it was had a lot of increases with, and we see this with Amazon purchases, 44% increases in purchases from Amazon, Peloton, 200, 128% increase in Peloton. So people are at home, they're wanting to, either they're improving their homes, they're adding on building, and that actually plays into our chapter nine with new construction and building and lack of inventory. Some people are staying put at their homes or just improving them, right? And others have decided, you know what, I'm reshuffling. I'm going to, now I have the ability to move. And here's yeah. some, here's a chart here. Here's yeah. So this is, yeah, this really speaks to the, the the how people are working more remotely now, which I think we know. But looking at it from a statistical perspective, how likely people were to have switched over, and it's the higher income people that were able to switch to working from home, likely wanted a bigger house. Uh, it's driven their desire to have you know uh, an additional office or maybe an additional couple of bedrooms in order to turn into offices if you have two spouses at home. So really really fascinating there. Um, I think interesting to see how the search traffic and the search traffic growth. Uh, yeah. So we contacted Realtor.com and had them share search traffic trends, uh, which which are up overall. Uh, people are definitely continuing to shop and look for houses. Uh, and then, then where people are searching. So talk just a little bit about this, Dean. We've got several slides on where people are looking for housing. Yeah, this is where we're talking about people are moving out, as we know, they moved out of the metros. They got worried about because of the pandemic around the urban areas and high metro markets. Uh, there's a big run and reshuffling. The typical uh, move was, as we all know, was not too far away from their jobs. But as I mentioned earlier, that now has changed. A lot of people have the ability to operate remotely. A lot of employers have permitted that. So we've seen a lot of movement outside of area, we'll have another chart we'll show in just a second, talks about the distance that they've moved and what is that as a percentage compared to, you know, back, I think, 2013 or whatever the number was. It was another year in the past yeah. and how that's conveyed. Yeah. So, and this is, this is uh, urban core versus suburban county growth rates. So you can yeah. kind of see this was already a trend that was happening, you know, where we were, we were seeing a decline in movement into the urban core and out to suburban counties. And the pandemic has just accelerated that trend. I think we have a, a, another chart here uh, looking at uh, the same for um, uh, Manhattan, you know, the Manhattan market, the New York market, uh, the population growth and domestic migration rates and seeing people move out of those markets. Same for San Francisco and California, uh, where you know, a lot of people said, you know what, if I'm going to be able to work from anywhere, I'm going to work from somewhere else. Uh, so I think that's that's a, a big part of that. And these these were uh, two of the, the the report covers uh, a whole lot of other areas as well. But these were two of the areas that we dove into just to illustrate the point of uh, what the what the increases are in moving uh, from these uh, core large urban markets. Um, so do you want to talk to talk us a little bit about this particular yeah, demographic slide here? 
Yeah, this is the one I just mentioned earlier, Jack. This is where you can see the total moves. And actually, it was in 2013. It's 2020. It's just two, or increases over 2019 and 2020. Yeah. And you can see as we break it out, and Paul breaks it out in this in these charts, how there's been increases. If you look at within 100 miles, and that's been a 58.3% increase over 19, and then a 99% increase if you're over yeah. within 100 to 500 miles, which is really something you, that's the change. And that's that gr the great reshuffling is people are more interested in moving further away. And that's played right to the pandemic and the two reasons I mentioned earlier, the change in their life and living and, and also work uh, and the work. Yeah, have a doubling of the out migration be more than 100 miles and yeah. even a 55 percent out migration in this New York example and a 50 percent for San Francisco, more than 500 miles. People really move yeah. far. Yeah, that's a yeah. significant that that's that's significant. So, yeah, we've seen influxes into the suburbs like we're talking about also in the secondary or I'm sorry, resort areas. A lot of people yeah. sometimes are like moving into either second homes or they're moving to resort areas just for their primary residence. Yeah. So, again, this is another one demonstrating the change. You know, this is showing from these areas, where did people move to? You know, so if they were uh, in New York. Uh, you, you can see New York, the highest category was the smaller metro areas, towns, and rural areas. So uh, it was the highest category. Second was mid-sized metro. Third was lower cost, but large metro area. So uh, the trend, you know, on, the, on the, the right side of each of these, you can tell is way up. And even, uh, even on the, uh, you know, you look at Miami, Washington, Chicago, it goes negative uh on on the the one side of the high cost large metro areas so um a strong trend uh into these mid-sized metros and smaller metro areas top markets uh, based on uh home price increases so you, yeah. you were you're were, you and i were talking about this earlier so yeah i'm markets, laughing early because yeah Jack is down in Austin, Texas. So I'm saying, yeah, and he's got some investment properties. So he's loving life. 37% increase yeah, uh, year over year. But, uh, all these other markets, you can see the increase is 40% higher. I mean, it's incredible increases, Phoenix. And we also see increases as well in uh, rental rates too, in other in, in these areas too. It really plays hand in hand. Uh, there is a chart that Paul puts in here that talks about the rental side and the rental side, seeing that, like, for example, Phoenix up 16 and a half, Vegas up 12.9, but Boston is down 2.7, Chicago down 1% in the rental rates. So not only do we talk about sales, but also in the rental markets. And that ties into people moving. That ties into the whole chapter of reshuffling and there's a, a move into another market, so other areas. Yeah, I mean, you'll notice the majority of these markets are, are, are not, I mean, other, other than, you know, San Diego, and, you know, they're, they're mostly, they're mostly secondary markets or, yeah, uh, yeah so it's, it's, it's just really interesting to see that and a lot of these are lifestyle markets too. A lot of yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah, I mean, Colorado yeah. Springs, I mean, I don't know about Youngstown, I've, I don't know what Youngstown is, but you know, I'm just having fun there. I'm from yeah. Pittsburgh originally, so I'm having a little fun with my Ohio friends, <laughs> nothing meant there personally. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, some of these other ones, Reno, uh, Stockton, you know, a lot of nice areas to live. And that's what people are deciding to do. Right. Yeah, that's it. So the pandemic intensified these changes uh, and decades long mobility patterns like you, you talked about in our intro to this particular trend. Uh, how people live, how people work. Massive uh, difference now. Uh, and like you said, the secondary vacation home markets, markets that really offer a lifestyle. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I think you, you you said earlier people want you know they they want to live their best life now and they're not waiting so I love yep. that yeah yeah all right so let's jump into we are at forty a show we're forty one minutes in so we're doing doing pretty well here Dean we're going to keep cruising along we got three more trends to cover and uh, that's a great spot to be at uh, fifteen minutes about fifteen minutes out from the end of the presentation so oh, yeah. uh, trend three the real estate financing revolution um, talk to us a little bit about this. Uh, basic, uh, this is fantastic, in-depth look at the history of the iBuyer and alt, we actually, uh, Paul brings out this alternate financing descriptive altfin, alt uh, depending on how you want to pronounce it, altfin, and that is a shift in the landscape of really, uh, and we get into this as to our takeaways, but the promises where we're trying to create a simplistic, transparent, increase the speed and the ease of transactions. Um, back in 2014, that's when Open Door entered the market as an iBuyer, an instant buyer. And from that, what this article, dive, this chapter dives into as a trend is that was the tip of the spear, really, because what's happened is 
more have come and followed that trend, have jumped in and created even more unique financing opportunities to allow purchasers and sellers to have much more flexibility and ease in the process of moving from one place to another. And it really yeah. dives in depth. In that. And it's gone more, it's more than just the, 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 the buying, you know, we'll buy your house from you aspect. Right. It's turned into an entire, that's what we call it alt fin now. It's because it really addresses all aspects on the, the purchase transaction, the sale transaction, the, the overall, the totality of that situation. So it's, it's, it's more, more tools uh, to help buyers and sellers get to their next situation, whatever that is. So these are some of the notable companies that we included in here. Uh, obviously, we've had, since we went to print, we've had a company exit this market and say, we're yeah. out and we're out. Uh, Zillow, uh, Zillow Group decided to shut down its iBuyer practice. Um, some would say predictably uh, based on what, what they could tell about that company and how they were executing. Uh, does this mean the iBuyer or the Altfin strategy is dead, Dean? Do we think that Zillow leaving means Not it's all. over? Yeah. Not at all. This has yeah. been integrated in, and we'll talk, the chapter shows this and a couple of slides coming up will show that others, other organizations have integrated uh, other Altfin, alt 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 uh, different yeah. ways of helping the consumer be more uh, ease at buying and selling and utilizing their services. So yeah. no way it's not going away. It's if nothing not else, it just meant all the competitors are going to snatch that market share and go yeah. for it. So it's, yeah. it's created that. Um, we've got some, uh, in the chapter, we detailed some of the average fees that are charged during these financial transactions, just to, to give some benchmarks. So we collected some mm -hmm. benchmarks in there. Mm -hmm. If you were curious about what these, what these offers look like and uh, how they work, uh, we've recorded them for you and also uh, how many homes were sold this way during uh, the first half of 2021. Um, There's also some historical data too that was shared. Yeah. Paul shares like when they first came in the market, the fees were much higher. And I remember yeah, yeah. the dialogue at the time was like, you know what? They're so outpriced. They're priced outside the market. It's much easier, much better for someone to go the traditional way of selling a home. But that's not the case anymore. Much closer. Yeah, they've, they've they've met they met the market. They came in, right? Spent some time figuring it out and have retooled and said, okay, we understand what the pricing we think should be for this service are. And yep. here's how here's how they they're doing it now. So yeah, uh, I'll, I'll talk real quick, Jack, on yeah. that last slide, uh -huh. you look at Zillow Group. It looks like they were exiting. Uh, before, you know, they've been exiting for a while. They're only 463 units. Yeah. first half of 2021. Yeah, so it's not it wasn't even they weren't even particularly. The, it wasn't the number one or the number two or the, even the number three, uh, yeah. based on these numbers. So yeah, that's that's right. And then I found this this to be fascinating to see um, how many overall purchases are happening. Uh, in different markets, where the where the the market share is of these kinds of i buyer trans the i buyer transactions themselves. So um, again, some places you would expect, and then some some that might surprise you. Phoenix has been a hotbed of you know new real estate stuff, so not that surprising uh, to see that. Well, there. the reason for that too, you know, the reason for a lot of the i buyers going into Phoenix was there's a lot of similarities. They actually Similar, could value. Yeah. Yeah, and the chat and chapter gets into this as well. It talks about when they first got into the into the business, first came in, was the idea of like a Phoenix area where you have a lot of homes between you know three hundred and fifty and five hundred and fifty. So there was like a price point they wanted to stay in. There yep. was a consistency of the size of the home, things like that. Yeah, yeah, very good. So good analysis of that. Uh, and this is might be my favorite slide in the chapter, which talks about how each of these uh, alt thin companies is is how they how they're doing it what they look like how they work you know what their offers are so this kind of comparison uh slide showing do they do i buying are they an in-house brokerage uh, there is a column here that says exclusively third party brokerage which means they are they will work with other brokerages and agents in order to complete transactions you the majority of these are now working with third party brokerages so they could be working with your firm if you're running a brokerage today or if you're an agent uh, they they have a they have a methodology for working uh, outside, and there's only a few that are only doing it for themselves. Notably, Realogy, Redfin, and Really. Um, but seeing which offer a home trade in or spruce up offer, cash backed offers to allow people to go to market with a as as cash uh, offer. Um, That's really another can't... offer a lot of people jumped on was the home trade um, the home fix up, home spruce yep. up. Yep. Yeah, big. So super, super useful. This is probably if you're looking at doing something in this category, 
this is probably your shopping list to say, hey, I want a partner. I want to work with a company that would do these things uh, and is, is friendly to us, right? Mm -hmm. So um, these are some of the companies that are uh, notable in terms of their uh, affiliated businesses as well, where they do both uh, uh, you know, brokerage and, uh, and lending as well, or insurance as well. Uh, a lot of these companies are also doing, um, are, are also offering uh, ancillary services and products as part of their total uh, portfolio and how they operate. So trend three, we'll wrap this one up. Um, real estate financing revolution uh, is intended to make it simple for consumers. Uh, promises are transparency, simplicity, speed, and ease. Uh, they've now had a few years to Get, uh, get with reality on fees and what it costs to do that and to build out uh, to some scale uh, and moving into scale. Uh, and that there are some of these Altfin companies that are broker friendly, that are actually working with brokers uh, today. And uh, for those of you that are in markets where this is a competitive question, uh, then you, you, have some, you now have some people that you can use this chapter to investigate further and see who would be a good partner. So, all right, trend two. Moving right along, uh, we got about 12 minutes uh, remaining. I've got my little clock is running down here, so we're going to keep it moving. Uh, private equity, real estate rising. So we in this chapter, uh, you know, Paul Hagee, who led this, led the research in this chapter, uh, did interviews with a number of private equity um, uh, people to learn more about the private equity industry and really document how it works. We can understand it better as it appears they are here, uh, they're here to stay uh, in real estate. So in this chapter, we go through an overview of what kinds of private equity investments, whether it's venture capital, growth capital, have what levels people talk about. Because as soon as you start talking to people in this space, they start using words like, "Oh, well, we're you know we're in our seed stage, or we're in, we're doing a you know we're 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 doing round one, round two, round three, that kind of thing." And you, you want to get a sense of what numbers are we talking about here, and what kinds of investments are these companies making, right? And what does that look like? And also what are the sorts of returns are they, uh, are they, are they trying to get? You know, if you're looking at early stage, they want a, a big return, but they're not risking a ton of money versus growth capital versus traditional private equity where they're looking to a 2X to 10X. So just kind of understanding where, uh, where they fit in. And we compare these to other types of return profiles um, and what, you know, what these profiles look like. So kind of being able to place the private equity people in terms of the level of risk that they're looking to take. This chart also, I think, helps understand where private equity is investing. Um, you know, this says these are these are this is a chart broken down on the performance of the company and the overall kind of financial health and health of the company itself to say, you know, where where um, private equity is looking to buy when they want to significantly, you know, profit significantly is they want to buy in the quadrant that's labeled reviving. This is a company that uh, it's improving their, their business practices. It's not they're not at the highest level of performance. Uh, and, and so it hasn't shown up yet where that private equity uh, capital can really help them get into the thriving category. So you have a lot, a lot of the private equity work is trying to identify the companies that where they can they can improve it and really get it to that thriving uh, place and that thereby make it a lot more valuable. So, uh, and this one, Dean, I know this is one of your favorite ones here. Talk to us a little bit about this. Is a cool chart talking about how how private equity investments are evaluated. Uh, I think it's very cool. Yeah, I think it's a great step-by-step -step process, uh, like this whole whole trend chapter is to allow the uh, increase your knowledge on exactly how this is all working and see how they're, the thinking that goes into the process of, is this a good investment? Is this a path that we want to go down or not? And it literally takes it right through those steps as you walk right through it. Um, and I, I think this was done, vi the visual is great and it actually is very simplistic and it's in nature yeah. and very easy to understand. So we're very This well is done. a cool one. You can take this on almost into any kind of yeah. acquisition or investment scenario and say, okay, well, these are my, these are my steps that we're going to go through in order to, to consider whether or not I'm going to go into a market or make an investment. So very cool. Uh, yep. We also have an overview of how the private equity, uh, you know, uh, workflow works uh, in an in an acquisition or in an investment and, and what that typically looks like it's usually about a five-year process you know they'll they'll spend three to six months evaluating uh, negotiate and acquire and invest in a company outline initial strategy and then work on the company for three to five years uh to to execute and then take an exit um, usually at the the five-year-ish time frame so that's a, a journey of a private equity investment and then we also included in the chapter 
uh, some of the top uh, private equity investors in res residential real estate industry, whether it's in technology or in brokerage or alt fin companies. Um, these are these are companies that have shown up and and, and made significant investments in uh, you know different entities in real estate, whether it is technology or brokerage. So, uh, trend two. This is a wrap up. Private equity has discovered us. Uh, they're here to stay, and they're they're you know, putting money into this industry in a significant way, uh, knowing how they think and act will help you in terms of thinking uh, from a leadership perspective of where uh, where they are intending to be, maybe where you want to be uh, if you're looking at being acquired or taking investment on. And uh, that we believe that this continued activity by private equity, equity is going to drive the consolidations that we talked about in the earlier chapters, that, that uh, that's going to continue to happen because the money is there. All right, uh, down to trend one. So the accelerating transformation, um, we got about five minutes left. So let's let's wrap it up. We'll end it strong. So this chapter is a is a bit of a kind of pulls it all together because the thesis is that we are in a new stage of real estate transformation. And I'll, I'll talk you guys through not all the stages, but we've uh, we did a, a study and really Stefan drove the study of looking at uh, where is our industry compared to how industries evolve. How does real estate evolve? And uh, in that evaluation, we looked at the last 150 years of real estate to say, here's what we think the major stages are. The last two stages, which is the internet and then capital infusion, have really set up where we are entering stage 10, the great acceleration, which means because we've digitized part of our industry and we brought capital in, now things are going to happen much, much faster. So that's the, th the thesis there. You look at the capital investment. You can see, you know, this is this is part of that thesis. Uh, in these four years, you had 1.6 billion come in. Then the last, in the following four years, at 8.4 billion. If you add in the rest of uh, rest of 2021, you're going to get to 10 billion handily. So the money is there, uh, and now that is setting up this acceleration phase. Um, you can also look and see it, start to see it happening in the top 10 brokerages. Um, Dean, when you and I looked at this list. Yeah. Uh, you know how, how this is consolidated. We've had um, you know three of the top ten consolidate up, and then as you go down through the rest of the top twenty, there's another another uh, you know three or four significant acquisitions, and these are these are being are driving all of that production volume into uh, the largest brokerages. Um, so this chart uh, that was super interesting, showing sales volume and transaction signs done by the top ten, the top one hundred, and the top one thousand brokerages. We see over 50% of the sales volume is now done in the top 1,000. And that's been creeping up over the last five years um, very consistently. So Dean, any comments on this consolidation trend and, and this acceleration that we're seeing uh, based on brokerage market share? Yeah, if you go back to the last slide, Jack, uh, yeah. the, what was interesting, 30% of the top 10 were acquired since 2013, yeah. which is interesting to our earlier conversation you and I are having. And I was looking at Home Services America, for example, number two on the chart in 2013 in the ranking that we ranked them as well as in the top 1,000. And you can see they jumped to 152 billion from yeah, 63. Yeah, it's one thing to say, oh, well, three of the top 10, you go like, well, this company uh, almost tripled in size. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it's, cra it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy, but that's to this whole chapter and the acceleration and what's happening is playing out right here in front of us. Yeah, for sure. Uh, big, big moves in that uh, in that chart. And then what's not what's not on here that is also relevant is like the EXP is because they they weren't there in 2013, didn't exist. They wouldn't be on the chart. Right. But now they now they're in there. Now they're you know number arguably number four. number four, three or four uh, on right. that list. Right. And Compass four. was not on this list either. Right. They weren't. Right. They didn't exist three. in 2013. So you have these other two. So besides the top three getting acquired, you've had yeah. two companies in the last seven years come out of basically nowhere to end cool. up in the top five. So really impressive, yeah. really impressive. Um, other events that we're seeing, they're, they're reinforcing, we've moved into this last stage of, uh, of, of you know, this, not, I'd say last stage, this latest stage, it's probably not the last, but definitely the latest stage of activity. You see all of the acquisitions and the going publics, and we now are having, you know, probably three or four companies a year going public in the brokerage space, which is unusual. We used to not have four companies that were brokers that were public, uh, but now it seems like there's going to be one about every 90 days. So yeah. tremendous amount of activity uh, happening in that space, um, continuing to move us along as an industry moving faster and faster. So that is trend one 
Uh, there's a lot more in this report. There's a lot more. We just had to move fast here. Uh, rolling it up, we believe we're in this new stage, stage 10. Things are going to happen faster. Uh, they show no signs of slowing down. Consolidation market share growth of the top companies will continue. That should play into your strategy plans and thinking about how consolidation is working right now, whether you are an, an acquirer or an acquiree or just want to know uh, where everybody is going, uh, that's part of your strategy and is important now more than ever to look how these large players operate and compete. So all that, that's your one hour, very fast overview of a, a, a pretty thick book with a lot of great information in it about the uh, residential brokerage industry and where we're going, where we're headed. Uh, any, any final thoughts there, Dean, anything to, to close with here? And then I've got a special offer for those of you that have been on the entire time. Yeah, I would say uh, this is to make better executive decisions, be more knowledgeable in our space. By far, this is roughly around 200 pages of over a th roughly a thousand hours of deep dives into the biggest, latest trends. We just gave you a snapshot of a fraction of what's in there. And I encourage you, if you're in this space, you need to uh, move forward and get that and have it sent to you. And it's great reading over the holidays. Yeah. And, and let us know if you have a group and you want us to talk to your group, any of these each one of these trends is easily, you can spend an hour, hour and a half on it, really digesting it with a group. Uh, and we've got a great team that, that does that all the time. If you have been on this webinar and you'd like to pick up a, a, a copy of the report, uh, we do have a pre-order uh, uh, pricing available for you. Uh, it's $20 off at t360.com slash WBNR, which is webinar with no vowels, WBNR. Uh, and you can get that uh, that at a little bit less because you came and you did a thing. Uh, and congratulations for that. So it was great uh, having everybody on today. Um, nice big webinar. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your week uh, and picks up a copy of the transport. If you just got yours, crack it open. You've got it for the holidays. You've got it for your strategy planning sessions. Uh, I know I went through it very quickly uh, while I was on a beach this last week. Uh, and I uh, learned a lot and learned a lot. Went into this presentation. I've still got more to do with this report. So great job. Thank you guys. Great. Happy holidays, Thanks, everybody. everybody.